Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Barawet Chola Sims, the Executive Director of AIT Extensions. And uh, today we organize a webinar series again at AIT Extensions uh, in close collaboration with the UNITAS and CIFAR networks. And um, uh, one of the important uh, hosts today, one of the important co-hosts with AIT Extension today is Special Olympics Asia Pacific. And we are really excited uh, to have our speaker today to, you know, uh, to speak to you, to share your ideas with a very unique, you know, uh, topics that uh, will be a lot of uh, learning and also benefit to the audience today that we believe. Because this thing is beyond social inclusion. It is also, so, it's just also beyond uh, leaving no one behind. But it is uh, something that you want to, we want to share with you on not to missing millions. And you will know the story about the approach, the activities that the Special Olympics Asia Pacific is doing in order to contribute and also to help the people, you know, who are, you know, have the intellectual disabilities through funds, sports activities that can be one of the means that people can explore how to really contribute to the SDGs and especially for helping people that are in a special need. So AIT Extension is very honored today that we have a speaker from the Special Olympics Asia Pacific, Mr. Deepak Natali. And Deepak is the regional director, regional president of the Special Olympics. And also he is the MD of the Special Olympics Asia Pacific. He has a lot of experience in working with NGOs in different countries, you know, in Singapore, in other places of the world and uh, through his experience working with the Special Olympics and also interaction with different countries, different host countries in these activities, he will share a lot of information that we believe that very, very good for us, good for you, good for everyone, so that we can crack this, you know, in the topic, which is, uh, you know, Deepak want to share with you on the topics called Breaking Barriers, Reducing Inequalities Through Sports and Inclusive Practice. Now, uh, Deepak, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chanasin. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us today to hear about Special Olympics. I'd firstly, of course, like to thank everyone at AIT, to CIFAL and to UNITAR for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful privilege for us to be able to talk about not only our work, but what inclusion really means for people with intellectual disabilities. And that's something I think that often uh, we we don't get enough opportunity to to do. And I'll talk more about why that is the case. Firstly, I'd like to start by saying there's a there's a few things today which I will be doing. Um, one of which is to show uh, several films, short videos on on different aspects of what inclusion looks like to us. At the same time, I do want to to share as much as I can about the approach we take. And I felt that this was the important thing uh, for, this, for this webinar today. It looks very much at how we can reduce inequalities through sport and inclusive practice, but also really looks at why that, why that takes place in the, in the way it does, what the methodology is behind that. So I hope this is going to be of interest to everybody. And certainly I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions at the end of the end of the session. OK.
Okay, so I really do enjoy sharing that film because I think it represents an aspect of our work which is incredibly important, a sports event. It shows what sport and competition are all about. It shows those things, the culmination of hard work, of dedication, of challenging oneself. And I think that's a really important principle around which Special Olympics is founded. However, at the same time, I think it's really important to demonstrate and to, for everyone to understand that this is only one small aspect of the work that we do. It, in, in reality, Special Olympics is not about an event. It isn't about staging a large event. It's about looking at the development of people with intellectual disabilities and ending discrimination against them, which is something which is prevalent today. Um, we are a global inclusion movement that uses sport primarily as a conduit to provide health and education and leadership development opportunities. Through that, we look to change attitudes towards intellectual disabilities, and we do that currently in over 190 countries worldwide. Um, many of you may not know very much about intellectual disability. Uh, those of you that do, then forgive me for going through this very quickly, but I think it is important. Um, it's a term used very much to uh, describe someone who has certain limit limitations in cognitive learning. Um, these limitations can manifest themselves in different ways and cause a person to develop and learn more slowly or differently. But the important thing to remember is that people with intellectual disabilities are simply unique. And that's just like anybody in the world. They take their own avenue towards learning and we have to be respectful of that. Um, from, a, from a medical standpoint, you're looking at someone who has an IQ below 70. And that means that they may sometimes find it difficult to make certain judgments. They may have challenges in cognitive skills, social skills, practical skills, or, or a combination of any three of those. What it really means is that they take many more steps, or maybe a few more steps, or just take a different approach to learning. It's estimated that in the world, there's about 2.3% of the world's population have an intellectual disability, and it makes it one of the largest disability populations in the world. What that translates to in the Asia Pacific region is about 54 million people with intellectual disabilities, which I, I'm sure you would agree is a significant, um, significant population within our community. However, disabled people, including people with intellectual disabilities, are 49% more likely to never have attended school and three times more likely to be, to be bullied. Um, in, and in, in addition to that, people with intellectual disabilities from our own health screening research that we've conducted are five times more likely to have diabetes. Now, these are just some of the indicators that we, we use. And as you can see, that, that demonstrates, I hope, to you all that this is a very marginalized community that we're talking about. So even though people with intellectual disabilities are a significant population, they face incredible social, cultural, and political barriers that really do create a stigma that prevents them from reaching their full potential. So with that in mind, Special Olympics very much works with the idea that if we provide high quality sport experiences alongside avenues towards inclusive healthcare and leadership and skills development opportunities that bring people with and without intellectual disabilities together, we can create inclusive, inclusive mindsets that will improve not only communities, but organizations. And through that, we create inclusive environments which can help people to people with intellectual disabilities to achieve that full potential I just mentioned. Ultimately, what that will do is help us to achieve an inclusive world. And we believe that that is the way for us to create a series of outcomes which not only improve the physical, social, and emotional well-being of people with ID, uh, not only contribute to uh, significantly more opportunities from a post personal development and a socioeconomic standpoint, um, creating a, a knowledge base of awareness around the needs of this marginalized community, but it also will mean that organizations and people without disabilities will behave more inclusively. Now, we see that as an avenue to really uh, uh, pr um, 
uh, progressing towards a, a variety of the different sustain sustainable development goals and certainly towards the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, this work towards inclusion focuses on reducing inequalities. It focuses on good health and well-being, quality education and decent work and employment. And those are really some of the significant aspects I will talk about today. So I wanted to show very quickly this flowchart diagram of our um, of a journey of a Special Olympics athlete. Today, I will focus very much on in, in talking about uh, how we address exclusion and isolation of marginalized communities through sport. I will talk about uh, inclusive play and about what it means to children and how sport and play come together. I will talk about health and well-being in particular, um, really looking at what some of the health issues are that people with intellectual disabilities face and therefore how inclusion can have an impact on that, inclusive practice can have an impact on that. And then we'll talk about inclusive practices in schools and work and inclusive education and what the, what the, what the value of that is. My final piece will really be about talking about how we engage the community. For me, that's about addressing discrimination through advocacy. And the people to advocate would be people with intellectual disabilities themselves. And that speaks very much to leaving no one behind. So starting with sport as an outreach tool, um, sport and competition itself, um, it, it generates passion, it's a human trait to be competitive. And that excitement, that passion that we feel is something that is felt universally. Sport also creates a common ground through which people bond and they can celebrate skills of each other. Inclusive sports in particular creates a safe space where everyone can feel valued and contribute with unique skills. Now, in Special Olympics, all three of those components are incredibly important. Um, as eight other things that drive our ability to engage people with intellectual disabilities in the first place. Given that they are so marginalized, it is incredibly challenging to be able to get people with intellectual disabilities to uh, engage with uh, direct services, such as healthcare, which I'll come on to in a little while, or indeed education systems. So for us, sport is a conduit to really being able to not only engage people with intellectual disabilities, but map them and be able to find out ways that they can be supported. Um, so I'm going to now show you a short video. Um, this is of an athlete in Pakistan. Her name is Sana. Um, and I think hopefully you'll see through this some of the principles I'm talking about here. दिमाग सही नहीं है किसने कहा आप हमारे साथ गेमों में जाएगी ठीक है और इतनी सारी सहेलियां बनाएगी इतने सारे लोगों के साथ बातें करेगी इस तरह मुंह झुका के नहीं मुंह उठा के देखो 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 उसको वो कह रही है ना रो सना जम करो जैसे वहां करती हो ना यस 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 वेरी गुड तो एक्सरसाइज करेंगे तो फिर हम कराची भी जाएंगे Special Olympics, Pakistan.
इतनी सारी सहेलियाँ बनाएगी इतने सारे लोगों के साथ बातें करेगी इसमें मुंह झुका के नहीं मुंह उठा के और दूसरा कि जब ये आगे जाएंगी Now, what I think is really important to recognize about that film in particular is how sport, as a regular part of anyone's life, can. Really support them to actually be something which they can use to then uh, take on different aspects of development uh, within them. So, um, for us, we can support people with intellectual disabilities. Having been engaged, as you see, Sana there, having been in an environment where she is completely ostracized, not only by her local community but indeed by several several members of her family too, you see her being able to take part in sport. and that then allowing her to look at different ways to speak for herself engage in wider community engagement and 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 develop skills that she would otherwise not have um beyond that really we are there to use sport as a way to provide health and well-being support as well um with that in mind health challenges for people with intellectual disability are incredibly significant We've done healthcare screenings for many years, um, and as part of that, we know that on average, out of ten people with intellectual disabilities, these are the statistics that they face: two have never had an eye exam, two would fail a hearing test, and six will have problems with flexibility. Are just some of the some of the health conditions that they they exhibit. Now, why that happens really is down to the fact that. There is insufficient training for healthcare professionals in general. Attitudes towards discriminate, uh, attitudes towards them, and discrimination are quite prevalent even within healthcare. And often they are there is diagnostic overshadowing. That's where we're talking about the fact that they have an intellectual disability prevents them from being diagnosed with other underlying conditions that might might well be be there. Um, what then that. Leads to is exacerbated health problems in the future for them, and um, we recognise that the fact that they often can't speak for themselves, and there is little recognition of how medically underserved they are, it can have a detrimental impact on the healthcare uh, provision that can be provided to them. So, in terms of being able to look at what equitable healthcare access looks like, it really does speak to inclusive practice. Um, The first step for us is about talking about sensitizing and training healthcare professionals to treat people with intellectual disabilities, to understand that they may be sensitive to certain actions or might need to go through uh, certain steps in terms of what uh, a healthcare professional might need to do in order that they might be able to to see them and diagnose them effectively. So a good example of this would be in an eye test. Instead of using letters which they may not understand, to use pictures and symbols so that they can actually speak to the things that they would be able to communicate alongside when 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 looking at that. Or indeed, um, when when it comes to dental care, often we find that people with intellectual disabilities, like so many of us, are quite frightened to see a dentist simply because it's about. Sitting down in a chair, a reclining chair, opening your mouth, and actually being having to let someone poke around inside. Now, if you're a person with intellectual disabilities and haven't understood what is going to happen, that can be a daunting process. So we do a lot of work sensitizing a dentist to being able to see what they could do to actually explain in more detail what they are going to be、um, undertaking as a procedure. That can often Involve things like using a teddy bear to put them in a in a in a doll's chair and turn it back to say this is what we're going to do with you and then we're going to open your mouth and so on. Those that type of training is critical. 
in addition, strengthening local capacity for inclusive health is something that needs to happen. So that's really about looking at healthcare institutions, looking at healthcare ministries and about how mainstream health systems can be sensitized to people with intellectual disabilities. And that speaks very much to the, the third strategy here, which is about improving the opportunity for people with intellectual disabilities to speak for themselves when it comes to their healthcare. I'm now going to play you another film. Uh, this one is uh, an athlete in Australia called Ruby, who speaks very much to her own experiences within healthcare, and I think offers offer some really interesting insights as to what healthcare means to her. Anyone can be an advocate. It's actually quite easy. It's about encouraging other people to do their best, not just other people, yourself as well. I've had to find ways to look after myself because growing up I had multiple health issues. I used to be like really nervous and didn't really want to speak up because I was afraid that people wouldn't understand. Doctors would dismiss me and say things like, oh well, we'll get to that, or come back next time. I had to become more confident and learn to speak up for myself. It wasn't a quick process. It took a long time to find the right doctors that would listen to what I feel and need. I started swimming at a young age because it would be good for my joints and it would make me stronger. In order for me to be independent, I have to keep moving because if I stop, I end up in a wheelchair and that's not where I want to be. I think it's important to have dreams and goals, to keep pushing myself towards things because I still love to swim and I keep training and challenging myself by joining competitions. I love seeing people succeed. It's great to see people achieve things they didn't think they could do. Everybody has the power to do what they want to do, even if it's hard. Get out there and give it a go. So with um, Ruby's, Ruby's uh, presentation there, she talks very much about not only about healthcare, but about the importance of physical um, and mental well-being. Um, obviously, that is very much related to health and healthcare, but we also see that as a very important part of uh, inclusive sport and before that, inclusive play. And that's why I really wanted to talk about what inclusive play stands for in Special Olympics. It's around early childhood development and young athletes. Um, we know that children uh, from the age of zero through to seven, that is an incredibly critical uh, part of their learning journey, their cognitive development and uh, physical, physical uh, development as well. So with young athletes, what we do is actually create a uh, learning environment, a play environment for people with intellectual disabilities, but create it in such a way that it is inclusive in its context. With that, what that allows us to do is to provide three focus areas for people with intellectual disabilities to learn alongside people without intellectual, children without intellectual disabilities. So you're bringing them into a play environment which stimulates them cognitively alongside children without intellectual disabilities. It allows them to improve their focus and concentration and it strengthens inclusion and fosters an acceptance and understanding that would otherwise not take place. It would be fine for them to be able to develop uh, those play in, in a play environment just with children with other children with special needs. But at the same time, the opportunity to actually develop to your full potential is around being in an environment where you maximize that. So being around children without intellectual disabilities actually will stimulate the child with intellectual disabilities further. 
and make those children without intellectual disabilities uh, avoid developing stereotypes and, uh, and, and having stigma around children that are different. With that, we know that we can create an inclusive environment that is valuable to all. I'm now going to show you another film, and I know I have a lot of films today, but these are incredibly valuable to us in being able to record and be able to demonstrate exactly what Special Olympics means. Uh, this one is a, a short film on our Young Athletes program. Young Athletes is an important component of our national program in Thailand. In the past three years, we have been able to expand this program to 75 out of 77 provinces nationwide. เด็กๆเนี่ยสามารถที่ว่าจะมีส่วนร่วมในการทํากิจกรรมเอาอุปกรณ์ที่มีอยู่ในห้องอะค่ะเหมือนขวดน้ําที่เหลือใช้แบบ
And this is where we take that unified sports model and put it into a co-curricular setting within a school. So you're looking at creating an environment where unified sports is a is a catalyst almost to to inclusion within a school setting where children with and without intellectual disabilities are given the opportunity to play with each other work with each other and then really look at how leadership within that school and empowering themselves to look at inclusion themselves is something they can do now we have uh, initiated special olympics unified schools and unified champion schools in over 30,000 schools in 150 countries worldwide our indications so far are that 95% of the schools report that programming uh, that this type of program creates a more inclusive school environment um 85% say that they have had uh benefits in terms of uh emotional and attitudinal uh views of each other and then students participating de- demonstrate a significantly improved attitude towards not only their peers with id but also with regard to what social inclusion is as a as a as an ideology this is a story now from papua new guinea um we have an advocate there pauline who speaks very clearly about what education means to her the importance of it for her and how she herself has had to address it i think that everyone deserves to go to school to learn in my old school there was a bully i told my teacher about it but they didn't do anything so i left school I needed a different environment where I am comfortable because I want to continue learning and finishing my school. I joined an open learning school so I can study on my own time and learn at my own pace. I work at Special Olympics PNG office in accounting and admin. I first joined Special Olympics as an athlete but now I am also a youth leader and I go to different school to share my story. The journey has been great for me. I became more confident and found the courage to speak up. When I speak at schools, others who are also bullied come to talk to me. I always encourage them and tell them not to give up. The teachers hearing my story do not know they have students with ID. They ask for resources so they can take better care of their students. Teacher also tell bullies to stop. People need to know we all learn differently and people need a choice to learn at their own pace. That's why I'll keep sharing my stories. I really like what Pauline says in that film because I think it speaks very much to what um what people with intellectual disabilities often face. What is disappointing is that she had to go out of her school system in order to be able to pursue her education. But as part of that, knowing that she goes back into her her uh, into the school setting to actually talk to other children, to actually provide them with an opportunity to um to uh understand what what it means to be in an inclusive setting and how to how that can benefit everybody is something i think is 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 incredibly um inc- incredibly warming um and it speaks very much to the final part of what i wanted to say today and it speaks about engaging with the community it it speaks to the idea that what we are trying to do here is really provide a platform for people with intellectual disabilities to be included within a setting uh with any within any setting and therefore within the community and society and for for us and as you've seen through all of the films that I've shown today this is really about providing people with intellectual disabilities with a voice 
It's about giving them the opportunity to speak very much to things that are important to them, whether that be uh, quality education, good health and well-being, whether it be reduce, reducing inequalities or indeed um, any of the SDGs that are important to them and their community. What I really want to stress, though, is that it can't stop at them advocating for themselves. It really does need to involve people without intellectual disabilities embracing what they have to say and learning how to be able to communicate most effectively and create a dialogue with people with intellectual disabilities as well. With that in mind, I wanted to show my final film today. And this is around uh, Daki, who's an athlete from uh, the Philippines, who now works in a prestigious bank in the country. Some of the things I love the most these days are my job and, of course, basketball. I work in HR. The best part of my job is that I am able to influence the future of others like me. So what it's like to work with me? I have a unique way of thinking and structuring ideas. Like everyone else, I ask for help when I needed to. I have a manager who mentors me and helpful co-workers as well. We're a team, both at work and on the court. When I was younger, sports taught me discipline and training, and I found a place that made me feel part of something bigger. It was being an athlete with Special Olympics, where I decided to use my voice to close the gap between people with intellectual disabilities and those without. Some managers still see our disability first without seeing our ability, but I keep pushing myself and working towards my dream. I already have some great ideas to start my own e-commerce business one day. To all the naysayers out there, you're missing out by overlooking us. We are more than capable. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I really want to just say thank you again. Uh, and as I, as, as I said, whether it be inclusive sport or inclusive play, inclusive healthcare or education, there is a space for everybody really to be looking at how this can be a, a wonderful fit for reducing inequalities. So um, I really appreciate everyone's time. And, and certainly I, I do recognize there are a lot of films in there. I do hope they've been enjoyable to you, to you and this has been informative. Happy to take any, uh, any questions at all. Thank <laughs> you.